Our next module is on workplace emergency preparedness, a very important concept in occupational safety and health. For our objective, after the session module, the participants will be able to know how to respond in a workplace emergency and participate during conduct of emergency drills. Before I begin my lecture discussion, allow me to show you a video of a very famous maritime disaster. Now, this maritime disaster occurred in a very important workplace, and I hope you will learn which workplace is this. Later on in this discussion, uh, in the next following the video, we will be discussing on the different failures of occupational safety and health in that particular workplace. What did you see? Iceberg, dead ahead, sir! Iceberg, dead ahead, sir. Out of starboard! Out of starboard, sir. Pull us down, both. Pull us down, both, sir. Close watertight doors. Close watertight doors, sir. Out of starboard, it is, sir. So after watching, you would have known that this is the disaster of the Titanic. So the Titanic is also a workplace. Now let's think about all of the failures in health and safety that occurred in such a workplace, which even up to now is still very relevant among the workplaces in the current times. In terms of emergency equipment, there were only enough lifeboats to accommodate 1,178 people versus the actual 2,208 passengers and crew of that ship. So if you look at it, there's already a very big gap on such numbers. In terms of training, the lifeboats were launched under capacity, saving only 705 of those people which is supposed to be prepared for a 1,178 passengers, right? Well, during that time, there were they were very particular on on the social class of the person, so they don't mix up social classes. Thus, those people uh, that were that were inside the boat were still um, considered. You know, that class is considered, wherein in emergency. No such thing should be happening. In procedures, the RMS Titanic ignored six iceberg, iceberg warnings before it crashed headfirst into the iceberg at, at near full speed. So in that sense, policy uh, procedure-wise, they ignored those warning signs. I mean, those warnings. In terms of policies, Contrary to popular belief, the RMS Titanic didn't have too few lifeboats to save, uh, to save room on the deck. But rather, they had too few because they were required. They were not required to have more lifeboats than that, right? So in terms of policy, the White Star Lines policy were horribly out of date. It was not updated at all. Now, this 
disaster, this workplace emergency that killed a lot of passengers at that time, it happened a century ago, more than even a century. But up to this date, up to this time, we still hear of workplace emergencies that the issues are the still these issues that were mentioned. So how do we protect our, our workplace from such failures? This is where emergency preparedness comes in. So let us first define what is a workplace emergency. A workplace emergency is defined as an unforeseen situation that threatens employees, customers, or even the public. It even disrupts or shuts down your operations. So think of any event that could disrupt that kind of uh, your operations and threatening your workers' lives. It even causes physical and environmental damage. Now, these emergencies can be natural or man-made. Let's look at this too. Natural emergencies are caused by forces of nature. So being in the Pacific Ring of Fire, the Philippines is very well uh, exposed and vulnerable to such natural emergencies. So what are these examples? You have your flood, volcanic eruption, earthquake, typhoon, drought, tsunami, landslide. So these uh, natural emergencies can even come in consequence, right? So if you're looking at typhoon, you will be expecting if you have, you have a you are flood prone area, you may have floods. Uh, earthquake, you may have tsunami and landslide. For volcanic eruption, even earthquake. Okay? So for man-made emergencies, this results to human error. Okay? Uh, fatigue, poor housekeeping, lack of training, and willful intent. In other words, man-made emergencies are workplace emergencies. So you have learned on the different hazards in the work workplace, right? The safety hazards. All right. So from that point, point of view, these are the effects of those safety hazards in your workplace, such as industrial fire. Okay, so they may come from electrical fire, right? So if you're in an office, you're prone or you may have electrical hazards in your workplaces, then that will expose us of vulnerable, uh, will make us vulnerable to industrial fire. Other industries such as in the chemical and the manufacturing, they can be related to chemical leaks, spills, chemical threats, uh, other man-made emergencies are your bomb threats, explosion, structural collapse, construction cave-ins, and your biological threats. So, why is it important that we should be prepared for the, these workplace emergencies that might happen? Number one is keeping our employees and responders free from harm. It's very important to be able to have the proper procedure to know what to do during emergencies so that we are even in this crying situation is we keep ourselves safe and not be harmed. If you know what to do, then you keep yourself safe, right? So in doing so, those people who are bound to respond rescue or respond to that emergencies are even kept from harm. Number two, manage life-threatening situations. So instead of breaking down during that situation wherein we are looking at a lot of casualties, we may, e we may be able to man manage and minimize this situation. Minimize damage to the environment, equipment, machinery, tools, okay? and minimize downtime. In the end, if we are prepared, um, the resumption of operations will be very, will be quicker. Okay? 
So, you have learned the different, you will learn the different occupational safety and health personnel. So, the role of your OSH personnel in your workplace, such as your safety officers, such as your first aiders and occupational health personnel, is number one, overseeing the implementation of emergency disaster preparedness programs and planning. They are the ones who will be assigned to assess the likely hazards in and around the workplace. They should be equipped with emergency management, knowledge, skills, and training. But not only the OSH personnel, even the workers should be equipped with the different skills and knowledge and training for them to be able to know what to do and respond even during emergencies. Determine necessary safety measures and other needs during the emergency situation and be abreast with the employee's medical data. So, how do you protect yourself and the employees and your workplace from emergencies? We must have what we call an emergency management plan. So, what is an emergency management plan? This EMP, no, Emergency Management Plan, covers the designated actions of employers and employees. They must take uh, to ensure that the employee safety in times of workplace emergencies. In other words, these are a list of actions, response designated to each of the employees and of the employer when an emergency strikes in your workplace. So that, of course, People will know what to do whenever an emergency happens in the workplace. So, we do not get caught in the middle and surprised, oh, we don't know what to do, and be in panic. So, in other words, we will be able to manage these situations. So, in the emergency management plan, the first part of it is reviewing the workplace hazards. So you had already a, a preview or a view of what are the workplace hazards. Remember our safety and health hazards. So we are we should be familiar and what could be the cost of these emergencies in your workplace. Then knowing also the types of potential hazards in your workplace. The fire hazards, your electrical hazards that may be uh, exposed, that may expose our workers to these emergencies. And you have to look at also, consider the number of people and the equipment exposed to those hazards. After which, knowing, so basically it is your hazard identification and risk assessment, right? So uh, that is the first part of your emergency management plan. Next is you evaluate your resources. So having seen and um, analyzed what your resources are, you have to evaluate. Do I have enough materials, equipment, supplies that whenever an emergency may happen in my workplace is is it will it be sufficient will it be enough that's the main question to answer next is in human resources are my workers am i do we have enough people who has the proper training who has the expertise to use this equipment and supplies you know, so many times there are it does not it does not become balanced. True enough, we have materials and equipment, but we don't the people don't know how to use them. Example, I used to have I used to work in a in a in a workplace uh, in transportation, and uh, they bought these. AEDs or your automated external defibrillator. So I'm very happy that each clinic, when we audited and inspected it, we were very happy and surprised. Wow, uh, this really, this is a really complete uh, clinic 
with all the AED in place. And I asked, so, sir, do you know how to use your AED? You know the answer? Actually, no, I don't have the training. So what are you going to do if you have, if you need to use the AEDs? Oh, I just have to call the nurse and the nurse is uh, still a 10 minute, a 10 minute uh, away from, from his uh, site. So you see, they have the proper equipment, they have the complete set of equipment and yet the people who are stationed there don't know how to use them. You have to call someone else to go there, right? So it can be the other way around, right? Like, for example, in a fire extinguisher, you don't have enough fire extinguishers, but your people were trained, you know how to use them, but you don't have enough fire extinguishers. So when you are evaluating your resources, you have to look at it. You have the enough materials, equipment, and supplies, and the expertise and the training. Okay. Now let's go to your four phases of the emergency management plan. Remember, your emergency management plan contains all those designated actions. Now, where do these designated actions come from? It should be coming from your four phases prevention preparation response and recovery so you must have the actions for prevention preparation response and recovery now as workers in a workplace you must be familiar and you must know your responsibility responsibilities in such plan let's start with the first phase which is in prevention Prevention, by the word itself, we want to prevent the emergency from happening. So, this includes all policies, procedures, and activities that prevent an emergency from happening, reduce the chance of an emergency from happening, or even reduce the damaging effects of such emergencies. Okay? So, all those occupational safety and health programs in your workplace such as your fire safety program your electrical safety program this is already part of the prevention so those are actions you know, policies and procedures that prevent an emergency from happening because of course our goal is not is for the emergency not to happen at all in your workplace so, in this side, we do our education and training on the different types of emergencies, good housekeeping, 5S, fire prevention and control methods, uh, your safety data sheets, and your risk assessment. Next phase is on preparation. Now, in preparation, we prepare. So these are your activities and procedures to make sure that your organization is readily or can effectively respond when an emergency happens, okay? So always remember that your preparation is as good as your response. So in preparation, we have to make sure that everybody will know what to do once the emergency happens, okay? So, how do we prepare? We prepare through your drills and exercises, such as your firefighting drill, proper first aid, evacuation drill, and this also includes your emergency reporting procedure. What does this mean? So, when a person or when a worker sees an emergency, such as a fire, what is the channel of communication from that point? Who reports? Uh, to the proper authorities, such as in your Bureau of Fire Protection. So, this is included in your simulation. So, your simulation, your drills, your exercises is part of your preparation. 
Next is on response. Now, in response, this includes all the actions taken to save life and prevent further property damage in an emergency situation. So, in this, in this case, the emergency is already happening. So, these are all your actions that you're going to do in your objective of saving lives and securing your assets so that your property uh, to prevent further uh, property damage. So, in response, this includes already your formation, formation of your um, formation of your emergency response team, your actual performance of your first aid, transporting your your victims to the proper uh, if they need be to the medical institutions. Okay, so in response, of course, our priority is to save lives always and secure assets but if you have to to choose no save lives is very important first rather than your properties okay and lastly again before i proceed to the last phase your preparation is as good as your response so it is very important that during your preparation you should be able to do the proper and effective actions so that when the actual thing happens, situation happens, such as in fire or earthquake, is you're able to evacuate on time. Right? Okay. So, response. Lastly, our last phase is in emerge, uh, recovery. So, in recovery, these include your actions taken to return to a normal or an even safer situation following an emergency. So why do is this equally important as well? Because our 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 focus on this is we are able to return to a normal operation. And we can do this by being prepared as well in the recovery phase. In recovery phase, our goal is shorter uh, recovery phase, short period of time. Why? Because every day that passes without you doing your normal operations is a loss of revenue, right? For example, your company every day is bound to have a revenue of a million, one million per day. If you don't resume one day, you're not able to resume in 24 hours, that will already equal to 1 million loss of revenue. What about two days? That would be 2 million and so forth. So our goal in this recovery is we are able to go back resumption to a normal, uh, normal phase, normal operations. Okay? So this includes your clearing operations, this includes your backup, your, um, your psychological first aid, no? With after a traumatic, uh, that kind of situation, this is also included there. Your accident investigation, if it's caused by an accident, this is part of the recovery phase. So in this next slide, it is important to know how to respond or to identify the common type of emergencies that might happen in your workplace. So if you're in a, in a building, what, what are you most vulnerable of during earthquake or during fire? So, of course, in an office setup, those are the most common that you can be exposed to. So you have to identify that common type of emergency and respond if you encounter a situation if you respond, if you encounter a situation uh, in an emergency, so immediately you need to, to know what to do right away. Respond when an emergency alarm is activated. So when an emergency alarm is activated, what are you going to do next? All right. 
for the following slides, I will be citing some of the common uh, actions that you will do in case of these emergencies. Okay, let's start with fire emergency. Again, I will not, whatever it is that your workplace have as emergency management plan, then you're going to use those in terms of action. Okay, so in case of fire, always remember your evacuation route and alarm. You should activate your fire alarm. And if, you're, if you know, or if you have the skill to extinguish the fire, then do so using your fire extinguisher and if it's beyond your ex uh, it's beyond saving in terms of extinguish because the fire is too big then very important that you have to evacuate to the nearest exit alert others in your area and never attempt to put out the fire alone and remember when you do extinguish your fire it is important that your exit should be at the back okay keep low to the floor during evacuation because of course the fresh oxygen is right in the one foot below uh, the smoke will tend, tend to go up so that so your fresh oxygen is way down below so keep low to the floor during evacuation if the smoke is too thick now in earthquake emergency in case of earthquake emergency you have to prepare okay so uh, always prepare uh, your or fix your fixtures that uh, that are vulnerable that will make you vulnerable in terms of earthquake so in prepping store your heavy objects near the ground secure your tall objects and again learn very important to learn the different your own exits the nearest exit that you have your evacuation route and your assembly area and it can it's very helpful also to keep your emergency items in your car or in your office so duck cover and hold we all we have already learned that a while back even when we were kids huh? so stay away from windows and objects which may fall on you and when during your exit, do not run and do not use your elevator. Remain inside until directed otherwise. Okay? But if you are in outside area, if you're in the outside, stay in an open area clear from any hazards and do not re-enter any building. And uh, workers are told to remain in the safe refuge area until they have been directed to uh, by the appropriate authority to leave or to go back to your workplaces. So after an, after an earthquake, um, we should be expecting for aftershocks. Do not panic, but stay calm. Uh, during also uh, this phase, you have to check your injured persons, assess, assist them as necessary. Um, you may be initiated to evacuate again after these aftershocks and use the telephone for emergency calls only. During typhoon emergencies, uh, it is important again to prepare. Uh, typhoons uh, in, in the Philippines are, are monitored by your pag-asa. Thus, you have to monitor it. Your, our weather services for the announcement or any warnings that might be in your area. As per, per area, you have a different uh, signal system. Then, learn the history of your flooding in your area. If possible, strive to know the elevation of your facility in relation to your streams, rivers, and dams. Okay? So, of course, if you are a flood-prone area, then you should know when to uh, Evacuate and how will you prepare? It? Prepare your uh, things and materials and equipment in the workplace. Then inspect areas in, first, in your facility subject to flooding. Uh, and you move your records and equipment and move it to a higher location so that uh, during the severe weather, with the typhoon and the flooding, uh, you will be your your um, equipment and records are safe. 
Identify your evacuation route again. Uh, keep your emergency equipment such as your portable radio, flashlights, whistle, and sp Turn off if you are inside your the building. Turn off your main electrical power. Then follow your established evacuation procedure. Never attempt uh, to walk across a flooded area. The water could sweep you away and do not try to drive through flood waters um, if you are inside the car. So in an office emergency, uh, in an office, it is important that you keep essential, emergency kit essentials for your workers, for your staff, so that whenever emergency happens, is you have provisions and you have uh, emergency kit and essentials that can help you um, prepare, uh, uh, you can help you in uh, to make sure that you are well provided during that emergency. Okay, so this is an example of your office kit, emergency kit essential, bottled water, first aid kits. So it is, uh, if you can see, these are your, for your food, for um, whistle, emergency blankets, huh? and basic utensils, okay? So that ends our emergency preparedness. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you have learned something. And please answer now. You may now answer the questions in the quiz after the video. Thank you.